Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving for this your day, Lord. We're praising you for the opportunity now, Lord, to just realize our rest in you. May we rest today spiritually, Lord, not full of uh, anxiety or fear in regards to our salvation, our eternal life, but let us just be resting in Jesus, his finished work, his imputed righteousness to us. And may we, Lord, truly physically rest as well, Lord. May we really get the batteries recharged today, Lord, being with our families. May your peace, Lord, just overwhelm all of us. We would just receive all of that great peace from the throne of God our Father. And Lord God, thank you, thank you for these souls that are here today, Lord. We're ready to worship you with all of our minds right now, with uh, all of the strength you give us. And we would ask, oh God, that you would bind us together, give us the same understanding of this, your word, as we start to finish up Revelation. I just want to thank you, Lord, for getting us through it. We pray, Father God, now that you would help us, Lord, to grip precisely what your intended teaching was, Lord, that we don't get sidetracked in any way. Lord, keep me from error, I pray. And uh, keep us on the same path with you by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we constantly agree together, Lord, over our teachers downstairs, for our children downstairs. Lord God, that you are being magnified and they are understanding and embracing, Lord, your anointed word. Enable them to grip it and to believe it in the name of Jesus Christ. Transform our lives, Lord God. Continue to teach us to walk in that new nature you've given us. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now I told you at the end of uh, last Sunday's teaching, as we got to the end of chapter 21, right about verse 22 to the end, I've kind of, I kind of uh, uh, overviewed a little bit of that, but I told you I think it is so critical for the church to understand that when Christ died, rose again from the dead, and came back in A.D. 70, uh, fulfilling that typological Old Testament picture of the priest coming out of the temple, coming back to the same people that he sacrificed to. Remember, Hebrews, the end of Hebrews, the ninth chapter, talks about that, that he, as he comes back the second time, he comes to affirm and confirm a salvation received. When the priest would come out of the Holy of Holies, because that means that the The sacrifice was received by God and he wasn't killed. He didn't make any mistakes, see? So he has to come out the second time and all the people outside are waiting for that. And then Jesus is second coming the same way. He comes back to the same people, the same generation he sacrificed in, and it confirms that God has accepted the sacrifice. And that's the that's the importance about the understanding of including uh, the finished work of Christ in the parousia as it closes the salvation program. It now fulfills that. Okay. So consequently, in regards to that, there is, a, there is a huge plan of God relative to saving not just people out of nations, but entire nations. And like I've said before, get my book. It's out in circulation right now. Some of you have got it. You know, finish up reading it, bring it back, put it back on the table, and uh, so other people can get going with that because we go into great detail establishing this doctrine that God's going to save entire nations. Remember at the end of last week's teaching, I gave you this little diagram right here, and I said, here's your legend, the dark spots here are a non-regenerate people, and the red spots are elect people, and as time marches on, you have less and less of the combination of the black and red, elect and non-elect, and as you get more and more towards the consummation, it becomes more and more a defined singular color, more people, more elect people being born into the earth, less non-elect people born into the earth, and so at the end, you have this massive amount of nations, entire nations, that are being redeemed by God. People in a certain nation at a certain time in the future, I mean, everybody just comes. You imagine a world like that where they're virtually the courts are non-existent. It's, it's not some utopian humanistic thing, but it's virtually non-existent. Why? Because the power of the gospel has gone out and Habakkuk 2.14 is being fulfilled and, and, and the, the knowledge of the word of the Lord is, is covering the earth just like the waters cover the oceans. I mean, it's massive type of, a, type of an overspread. So what we've got here is there's a couple of comments at the end of chapter 21, and I just want to lean into that a little bit and then take us into the 22nd chapter. My intention today on the 22nd chapter is just to get us past those first four or five verses, and then next week I'm going to finish out the remaining verses in chapter 22, and we'll have a conclusionary sort of statement at the end of uh, next week's teaching. But notice chapter 21 and verse 22 now. We'll just kind of review a little bit. He says as he is talking about this city, the city of the living God, and this city is who now? It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that. He says in verse 22, I saw no temple in the city, in the church, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. 
Very important because there is no Old Testament, Old Covenant worship going on within the church. There is no temple in it. There's nothing temporary about worship in the church, in the city. The temple was temporary. It was for a time. Now it's all fulfilled, done away with. God makes a large statement about that as he, as he closes down the very functionality and the existence of the temple in AD 70. Verse 23, And the city, or the church, has no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And we pointed out a little bit of an allusion there to Israel as the sun, moon, and the stars. We've already seen that the nation itself, according to chapter 18, and I believe it's verse... 21 speaks about the fact that this Babylon, which we see as Israel and Jerusalem, shall never rise again. He speaks about this, and we went through the annihilation passages where he shuts all that down. There is no continuation of the sun or the moon, the longevity of that uh, ethnical group. And we pointed you out to uh, Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10, which is the uh, initial occurrence of that phrase, sun, moon, and stars, representing the nation of Israel. Verse 24, by its light, the light, now watch this, by its light, what does its refer to? Yeah, and the city is the? Okay, so by the church's light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Let's keep going. And its gates will never be shut by day. Um, always able to come into the church. They will bring, there will be no light there, no darkness, because the presence of God is continuous. 26, they, the nations, will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, or the, the kings of the earth, I should say, will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Now focus in on verses 24 and 26 for a second. 24, by its light, by the light of the church, will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Now, can, now just imagine here, what he's talking about here is he's talking about all of Russia coming in to the one true church. This means that at this time in history, doctrine is pristine and is accepted by all. There is, not a, there is not several different views of justification or eschatology or differences of opinion in regards to the Trinity because along with this perfection, this completed work of the full impact of the kingdom of God, heaven truly has come to the earth. The heaven and the earth have joined and there is one mind, you see, on these things. There's not a lot of discussion going on at this point in history. People believe the same thing. There are no more competing religions you know, the Muslim religion is gone. It's been gone for maybe hundreds or even thousands of years at this point. There are no cults or anything like that. People are believing the same thing. This is the impact and the import of this full salvation work, this salvific work that consumes all of the nations, you see. And I think it's absolutely critical to embrace this. Now, you've got to embrace this according to your belief in the Word of God. If you don't believe the Word of God, you're going to believe CNN. You know, and CNN is not there to paint you a picture about faith or the conditions of the world. And it's easy for us to get overwhelmed because we're watching the news five, six days out of the week or something like that. Right. And we're hearing about this disaster in Afghanistan, this disaster in Russia, this disaster in France. We're hearing about this crazy group of people going off to do this with this murder, these terrorist attacks, these train derailments, these bombs going off. Oh, good. Let's North Korea. Let's test another nuclear bomb under the earth, you know, and let's see it have a bunch of mitigating effects in regards to the tectonic plates and they shift and earthquakes happen. You know what I'm saying? But you have to believe that God's work through his son that he is predestined and predetermined to do is more powerful than anything you see men doing in rebellion to that. If you don't believe that, I feel terrible for you. Now, I can understand if somebody's struggling with it. I, I totally understand with that. Maybe you're just now starting to hear about it. You're starting to embrace it a little bit. That's okay. But when somebody goes, no, no, that's never going to happen. You know, that's like, that's like either really naive spiritually, uh, that's ignorant of the Bible, or it's direct rebellion against what God is saying. You know, I, I don't know. We bring a lot of uh, baggage into our Christian experience. And a lot of that stuff has to be taught out of us. And it takes time. I, 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 I'm the poster boy for it taking time, you know, but God is a good and kind and merciful and he will help us all to get on the same page. All right. So with that in mind, I just want to quick give you some passages and I suggest that you write them down and just listen to me read them. That would probably be easier because I'm going to do this kind of quick so we can get into 22. But I think this is important. And if a pastor thinks it's important, then it is. Psalm 86 and verse 9. You can make a note of that. Now listen 
You're going to be listening for what God is saying about saving entire nations, not simply people out of those nations, but entire nations. Psalm 86, verse 9, he says, All the nations that you have made, speaking to God, shall come and worship before you. What? All the nations that you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and glorify your name. Now write down Psalm 22 and verse 27. See, I don't think these require a lot of explanation. I think they're plain on their face. Psalm 22, verse 27 says, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall one day remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you. Isaiah 49 and verse 6. Isaiah 49 and verse 6. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations and my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. See God's intention in all of this. I already quoted uh, Habakkuk 2.14 for you, but you can write it down. For all the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Is you know, I believe this is ongoing. This is happening. This has been going on ever since Jesus sent him forth. And in about 25 years, all of the Roman Empire, all of the world, the oikumene, all of the, uh, the habitable earth at that time had heard the gospel. And that was the only qualifier that Jesus gave in Matthew 24, verse 14, in regards to this gospel of the kingdom shall go out in all the world. And then the end, in other words, the end of that worship and that temple system will come. Let me help you right now. Okay, so the question is, is that how can you tell the difference, like say when one of the Psalms, like Psalm 86, 9, speaks about all the nations coming to worship the Lord, and where, say, in, uh, in Matthew 24 or Colossians, you know, uh, where he talks about uh, all the world at that time or the earth at that time uh, uh, will come to, to hear the word of the Lord and this sort of thing. The context in each of those tells you what's going on. Matthew 24 in regards to the Olivet Discourse, gives us a definite time frame. He places the events of those things happening within the lifetime of those whom he, who are listening to him at that moment. The only people that could be constituted as the world at that time was the Roman Empire. They knew nothing else outside of that. Now, when you look at Psalm 86, or rather Psalm uh, 89, or something like that, like we're looking at right here, the context here is a, prof is a prophetic. It's not speaking to one specific period of time. It's prophetic in regards to it goes out and it includes all the nations, okay? But it also says something's going to happen. Now, what I just read to you, for instance, was that all the nations will come and worship. Well, see, Jesus never said that. Jesus never said that in the Olivet Discourse. None of the apostles spoke about that in this context. When they talked about the gospel going out into all the world, the gospel went, uh, came into contact with everybody in the world, in the Roman Empire at that time, but not everybody believed it. Not everybody. See, one doesn't demand the other. Just because it goes out to all of the nations doesn't mean that all the nations at that particular time are going to buy it or believe it. Because clearly, at, the, at A.D. 70, all of the Roman Empire was not Christian, were they? There was a large chunk of them. And now the only qualifier for the end coming, for Christ to come, was that that gospel would go out into... It doesn't necessarily mean that they would all believe it. But now we're looking at a context and a passage that speaks about... All people who have been transformed and are now able to worship all nations, all families of all the nations. So that's the major difference right there. Now what we're going to get to see here, these next few verses, is we get to see John begin to conclude the book of Revelation right here. And as he does this, he's going to borrow some more uh, metaphor and analogy from the Old Testament. Specifically for these first few verses right here uh, in Revelation 22, he's borrowing heavily from Ezekiel 47. And you should note that and you should read Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47 uh, uh, typifies what kind of worship, using metaphorical terminology, the people of Israel are to have towards God as God brings them back out of Babylonian Medo-Persian bondage. And uh, the entire uh, typological structure of Ezekiel 40 through 48 is very important to understand this. And John is drawing heavily from it. There are some differences, and that's fine, because he's just interested in using it as a metaphor right here. But it's important to read this. Okay, chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel, or he, that's a reference to the angel, 
showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. And the city is? Church. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything cursed, or better, and every curse will no longer be. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him, and they will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Now, a lot of this is couched right in Ezekiel 47, so it's important to read that do that this afternoon if you would, and uh, you'll see the hook that I'm talking about right here. Look at verse 1 with me. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, this is pulled from Ezekiel 47. The way this is presented in Ezekiel 47 is it demonstrates that this water of life that Ezekiel sees comes flowing out of the temple, the, this rebuilt temple. Now, this is a metaphorical temple. It's not the actual rebuilt temple. Again, Ezekiel 40 through 48 is talking about the level of high level of spiritual perfection and worship that is to be Israel's, but never can it ever be understood as something that is to be physically built. That's like living under the law again, doing it by the flesh. Rather, it is fulfilled in the church, and chapter 21 and 22 of Revelation specifically fulfill the typology of the rebuilt temple and worship system in Ezekiel 40 through 48. So I do recommend you, you read that. But here in Ezekiel 47 is where this is pulled from. So what Ezekiel sees is he sees this water just begin to trickle out of the Holy of Holies, dead center in the middle of the temple proper. And then it goes out into the holy place and then down the steps into the court of the priests and then it flows out into the other courts and all the time it's flowing it's becoming massive and it's getting higher and he uses language like he says i would i would eventually start to wade through it and it was up to my kneecaps then it was up to my waist you know then it became a torrential river and i couldn't even swim anymore this thing was so just so huge and again this water this river of the water of life jesus referred to the gospel uh, the word about himself as the water of life for instance in john chapter 4 starting at verse 14, John 4 and verse 14, you know, he's talking to the woman, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, you know, and, he's, and he, she's saying to him, you know, well, uh, I, you do want to drink of this here water? And he says, well, whoever drinks of this water is going to get thirsty again. But the water that I shall give, you know, will well up to him. It'll be like a spring of the water of life. You'll never be thirsty again. And she says, well, give me this water continually or give me this water evermore. Well, this is the fulfillment of that right here in using typological terms. Jesus is, is through the Holy Spirit giving this to John, having John pull this analogy from Ezekiel 47. And it's important that you understand that the analogy, even though he doesn't speak directly about how that the, the waters become rivers and you can hardly swim in it. I mean, it's just so overwhelming. It's like that Habakkuk 2.14 idea where the glory and the knowledge of the word of the Lord covers the earth like the waters cover the oceans. Just huge and massive, you know. That's what's happening right here. He's trying to talk about the whole earth, all the nations being covered in this water of life. The angel shows me this river of the water of life. It's bright as crystal. It's perfect. It has no additives, right? Flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Now, right there, you should write down chapter 22, 21, verse 22. Chapter 21, verse 22, right at the end of verse 1 here. Chapter 21, verse 22. It's important. Because 21.22 tells you where the throne of God and the Lamb is located. Where is it located? 21.22. Exactly. It's in the church. Therefore, this river of the water of life that extends out and it's going to extend out to all nations is flowing from the church. See, God's work of redemption happens among His people, His church. Not really necessarily from, you know, the, the, the preachers and the teachers and the pastors and that kind of a thing, but it's the church. It's everybody that makes it up. And this is how this becomes an overflowing thing. He says that it's from the throne of God and the Lamb through now, verse 2, the middle of the street of the city or the church and also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Now, 
Uh, Ezekiel 47 speaks about this tree, but not just a tree, trees with fruit and all kinds of leaves. John is just locating it down to one kind of fruit. And he speaks about a, bearing a tree that bears fruit 12 times a year, or I should rather say 12 different types of fruit bearing, uh, one for each month out of the year. And the idea, of course, is this tree of life, we haven't discussed it yet, we're about to, this tree of life has got something that brings forth redemption and draws nations into the church and restores nations from sin and sickness and this kind of a thing. And it's around the clock. It's around the year. It's 12 months in, 12 months out, see? And it's important. You'll see that the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I saw a hand go up. Let's talk about that right now. Let's talk about this tree of life. Why is John choosing this analogy, this metaphor, of the tree of life as being, as being something uh, by which God uses through the church to bring the redemption and healing and restoration of the nations to himself? Why does he do this? Okay. And like uh, Jerry just said, this tree of life is symbolic in particular. First place you see the tree of life, of course, is in the Garden of Eden. You, you hear about it and see it in Genesis, the third chapter, literally Genesis 3, verses 22 and 24, talks directly about it. And we see that because of the way Moses describes the functionality of this tree, that really this tree in the, in the Genesis story, in the Adamic Genesis story, uh, is there to perpetuate physical life. At least that's the way it comes across in that context. Now, I don't want to get into a discussion as to whether we should see this, this Genesis 1 through 3 thing as, as hyper-symbolic or if it was actually literal and historical. I think it was historical, well, so I don't want to get into that. But let's just take what we've got right here from what the text says. On the one hand, the first occurrence of the tree of life is there to perpetuate life. So that does speak not only physically, because, you know, ultimate perpetuation of life is spiritual at its root and at its core anyway, isn't it? And when Jesus brings us healing in our lives, it is, being, it, is being, uh, uh, it is coming from the direction of that which is spiritual, that actual spiritual work that he did on Calvary. So we can say that the tree of life perpetuates life. It certainly doesn't bring death. It certainly doesn't bring death. So that's important. Genesis 3, and 24 is your text for that. But also, secondly now, the tree of life is used metaphorically elsewhere in the Bible, specifically in the book of Proverbs. There's four different times in the book of Proverbs where the tree of life is used uh, to express a metaphor for something. For instance, it says that the tree of life, uh, happiness, for instance, is like a tree of life. Uh, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 18 talks about that. Proverbs 3 and verse 18, happiness is like the tree of life. Uh, chapter 11 and verse 30 speaks about wisdom being like the tree of life. Chapter 11 and verse 30 of Proverbs, wisdom like the tree of life. We also see that uh, in chapter 13 and verse 12, chapter 13 and verse 12, a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Proverbs 13, verse 12, desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And then finally, we have a reference to uh, tree of life and health, physical and mental and spiritual health is spoken of as a tree of life in Proverbs 15 and verse 4, Proverbs 15 and verse 4. Third and finally then, we've seen now, first of all, that, it, that in Genesis 3, the tree of life perpetuates physical life. Uh, secondly, we see in the book of Proverbs that it's used as a metaphor for all kinds of great stuff, desire fulfilled, healing, happiness, wisdom. You know, these are important things. Third and finally, we've got the tree of life in the book of Revelation described as something that is conditionally appropriated. Conditionally appropriated. And this is where it gets interesting because there's two spots that speak about the tree of life as something that is appropriated conditionally. The first place is in chapter 2 and verse 7 of Revelation, chapter 2 and verse 7, where all those who are overcomers, they overcome sin, for instance, and overcome the opposition to the gospel. Those who are overcomers will eat of the tree of life in the midst of God's church. So there is that conditional aspect. Clearly that has to do with the perpetuation of spiritual life and to some degree, some physical life, but I'm not entirely sure how that's actually going to play out because I just don't know. I don't think Scripture is case-specific enough. So there's that aspect of being an overcomer. But secondly, in order to have the right to eat of the tree of life, one must be obedient to Christ's commands. He must be a doer of Christ's words in order to have the right to eat of it. And that's right here in chapter 22 and verse 14. You can write that down. We'll look at it. Chapter 22 and verse 14, where the angel says, or John says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right 
to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. There seems to be this aspect of washing one's robes, and I think that's a grace move. I don't think that's something you will to do until after you have been brought into the kingdom, and then your will is lined up with God's will in all things. But there is this washing of the robes. It could have something to do with ongoing sanctification, but I think it leans more towards that one-time justification myself. But let's, let's dig into this just a little bit further. Looking back at chapter 22... And verse 2, it speaks about the fact that this, in the middle of the street of the city, in the middle of the church, on either side of this river, is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, restoration year, year round, yielding its fruit each month. Now watch. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. See? Well, all these nations we just read about in chapter 21, verses 24 and 26, right? The nations are coming into the city into the church they're coming in bros bruised uh, broken damaged you know they're bringing all their their baggage with them you know and i mean there needs to be therapeuo and that's the greek word here for healing therapeuo which means restoration there is to be this restoring so the leaves of the tree are for the restoration of the nations okay already now we begin to see that the and this is important the analogy of the tree of life has to do with the means of grace through which the church ministers restoration to the nations, to the people, see. Uh, It is restorative, and it's the means, but because, you know, we're going to get down into verses 18 and 19, and God's going to give a warning here. He's going to say, if anyone adds to the words of this book, God will add unto him to the plagues of this book. Now, 19, if anyone takes away from the book of this prophecy, Watch, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city. The idea being, if the holy city, of course, is the church, and it is the church, if God is taking something away, it's because they thought they had it. Once again, we're talking about if somebody removes from the word of God, adds to it or removes from it, they're doing something that exemplifies and demonstrates that they're not in Christ. (laughs) Because a Christian doesn't do that, you see. A true born-again person does not alter God's word intentionally. This is the seriousness. This is why I harp on this so much. You know, this altering of God's word. So there is a taking away of his share in the tree of life. It has to do with a share in the ministry of restoration. Because the leaves of the tree are for the restoration of the nation. Somebody who is taking away, altering, changing the word of God does not have a share and does not have the right to minister restoration in the kingdom. It's as simple as that. Now, verse three, as a result of the nations being healed and restored, he says now, no longer will there be any uh, anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it. That is in the church. And his servants will worship him. Uh, The Greek is a little bit, this is not too bad, except I don't like the fact that they've taken the word accursed and exchanged this. That's an adjective, and the word is a noun in Greek. Curse is a noun. But in any case, he says, no longer will they be anything accursed. Uh, Better, and every curse will no longer be. And every curse will no longer be. Now, this is not in reference to Uh, the curse of the ground as a result of Adam's fall. This is talking about every curse. There is no cursing inside of the church. There is no cursing of God that has any power. There is no cursing of man towards the church. Every curse will no longer be. Now, why do I say that this has nothing to do with the Adamic curse? Because in Genesis 3.16, as a condition and as a a punishment, of course, in regards to... Adam allowing his wife to usurp his authority and for him following after his wife because 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14 talks about the fact that, you know, this is the same thing when a woman usurps the authority of the man in regards to a teaching position. It's the same thing in regards to what Eve did for Adam. And anyway, we'll, we'll get to that another time. <clears throat> it says in Genesis three sixteen, he says, because you have, done th- you have done this, then cursed is the ground very important phrase cursed is the ground because of you thorns and thistles you will eat you will eat of the plant of the field that's why i don't eat much vegetable but it's cursed i'm kidding all right eat of the plants of the field and that kind of a thing 
And uh, then he speaks about by the sweat of your face, you'll eat your bread, you know, until you die because you were taken out of the ground. We've covered that already. Okay, that's interesting, isn't it? Now, let me tell you something. <clears throat> when it, this is the only place when God says, I'm cursing the ground for your, for your sake. Until you get to chapter 8 of Genesis and verse 21, you should write this down. Chapter 8 of uh, Genesis and verse 21 is the very next place where you see God speaking about the ground and cursing. He says, I will no longer, chapter 8, 21, I will no longer curse the ground as I have done. Now, everybody thinks that that's a reference to the flood, but it's not. It's not a reference to the flood. You know why? Because when he begins to talk about the Noahic story starts in chapter 5 and goes all the way through chapter 8, he starts talking about this flood and, and all that it's going to be. Not, not one time does he ever speak about it as a curse. He doesn't curse the ground. He kills sinful men. Sure, there's physical ramifications, but that doesn't mean the earth is cursed. Not, it doesn't curse the earth. See, it's not that. The, the first time you hear about the ground or the earth being cursed, and it's ha'edetz in Hebrew, it can be earth or ground, depending upon the context. First time you hear it is when God drops this curse in Genesis 3.16, and it directly relates to Adam and to his posterity. The next time you hear that phrase, no longer curse the earth or curse the ground, is after the Noahic flood. And what God is doing is when he says, I will no longer curse this ground, he's removing the Adamic curse at that moment. Why do you think we have fruitful, flourishing fields and fruitfulness all over the earth? If, as some people believe, uh, we are still under this Adamic curse relative to the earth, then nobody would be eating much at all. I mean, we would not have what we have. Sure, there's an occasional famine, and sure, there are arid parts of the world and desert. Not the point. The point being is that we have flourishing fruitfulness, and we always have had that to a greater or lesser degree. But prior to the flood, they did not have that. Prior to the flood, they did not have that. So that's important. The reason I say all that is so that you don't fall into making the mistake that when it says here in verse 3 that there will not be anything a uh, curse or, or there will no longer be any curse, it's not referring to the Adamic curse on the earth or, or anything like that, or, nor is it referring then uh, to uh, the fact of Adam's fall in regards to his sin. And that's not referred to as a, a curse there either in Genesis, the third chapter. He says, but there won't be any more curse. He says, but... Nothing, no curse inside the church, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. Well, that's why there's no curse. The presence of God is here. And his servants will worship him. Did I see a hand? Oh, you were stretching. Okay. <laughs> Verse 4. He says, they, his servants, that is, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Isn't that fun sounding? Don't, I think that's fun. They will see his face. Now, the his here refers back collectively to God the Father and the Son. Now, you should write this down, okay? Well, before you write this down, let me say this. I, you know, I'm never at a loss for jarring people. I don't know. If it's jarring, it's, it's be, I don't think it's because of what I say. It's because of what we've been taught. And now I say things, you know, and I jar you and it gets your attention. And it results in people get mad at me, you know, or they go, isn't that interesting? Or they got, I don't get it. I don't know. So <laughs> when the Bible says, when the Bible says that they will see his face, Think back to Exodus 33 for a second. Moses says to God, let me see your face. And God says back to Moses, no man can see my face and live, right? Okay, no man can see my face and live. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they, they are unatoned for at that moment. There was no finished final work of, of Christ that cleansed them, put them in righteousness, imputed his righteousness so that they can be in the presence of God, okay? But now watch this. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, you should write that down. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed to us in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed to us in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, John 14, verses 8 and 9. John 14, verses 8 and 9. You know the story. Philip says to to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough. That's good enough. And he says, Philip, haven't I been with you so long that you still don't know who I am? He was seen me, Jesus says, has seen the Father. Now, there really is no case-specific text that says we will ever see the Father's face. There just isn't. There just isn't. 
that people will say, well, but there doesn't tell you what. Okay, now wait a minute. There are texts, however, that tell us whose face we will see, and that face is the face of God the Father. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've got to tell you something. That's more than enough for me. I hope it's more than enough for you. Uh, some people are kind of like, well, you know, now, hey, I don't know everything. And the Bible does not reveal absolutely everything either. But what is supposed to be being revealed here is Jesus Christ is glorified in this finishing up of the salvation program. And it's Christ who is the focus. It is King Jesus who is the focus. And he's the one who reveals who the Father is. See, Jesus came to reveal the Father. And Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, no man can understand or come to know the Father unless I, the Son, choose to reveal the Father to that person. See, remember Jesus said in John 4, 4 that God, the Father, is spirit. Those who worship him worship him in spirit. See? He is spirit. He, he is not physical. I don't know what there is to see, except for when God has revealed himself in metaphorical terms and visionary terms to the prophets and this kind of a thing. And, and the pictures are always different. I don't think we need to be concerned with that. I'm certainly not concerned with that. It says, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. The night will be no more. They will need no lamp of light or sun for the Lord God will be their light. They will reign forever and ever. I got to stop. Father, we just give you thanks for giving us the word today. And we ask, Lord God, that you would bless our time of fellowship now downstairs. Ready us for worship today. In Jesus' name, amen.